everybody, you are getting lost in plot. The show where we focus on story first, but not exclusively, across the mediums of film, television, video games, really anything with a story. I'm Wade, that's my brother Jake, and today we have for you, The Empty Man. Time to go get lost in plot. Now we're going to be getting into some spoilers here. Consider this your warning. Here we go. So an ex-cop suspects a series of mysterious disappearances in a small Midwestern town may be linked to a supernatural entity. And that is our plot synopsis for The Empty Man. That's a very basic generic setup and premise, but what our writer-director does with it is very unique. And especially when you talk about the, the structure for this film, because usually films have what's called a hook. That's, you know, the, your hot opening. It can be as quick as a few seconds or a minute. It can be usually as long as maybe five minutes. Something attention grabbing. Yeah, something right. to get your attention and pull you into the story. This hook goes over 20 minutes long before you get that opening title credit. And then you completely change locations. We start with a, a group of four, four kids that I guess are backpackers who go hiking through the mountains. Trekking through the mountains yeah. of where are we? I don't Island, know if it was Nepal Bhutan, or if it was Tibet. Nepal. Yeah. Something like that. Somewhere like that. We're yeah. there with them for 20 minutes. They go through this harrowing ordeal that is terrifying, man. Like, that sets it up, and then, boom, those those title credits roll, and then we're somewhere entirely different. We're in the Midwestern town. That's right, and that's when the actual kind of story story begins. Now, that is a bold choice for how you're going to open your movie in 2021. So who's responsible for making such a bold choice? Let's find out who wrote this. That's right. Now, say my name. All right, guys, we're talking about who wrote this, and the man is David Pryor. Now, we don't have much in the way of notable credits, which is really interesting to me and, and surprising for me. David has uh, he's directed a bunch of stuff, and he's written some, but mainly they're featurettes. They're like the behind-the-scenes featurettes that you might watch if you buy... Like the DVD. Yeah, they're the back. extras you used to get on yeah. like your Blu-rays when you get. If you were an aficionado or you really loved a movie and you and wanted to get of more of it, then then these featurettes are behind the scenes yeah. glimpses at things. Exactly right. And a lot of them, interestingly enough, are for David Fincher films. You got Zodiac, Benjamin Button, um, Social Network. Those kind of behind the scenes featurettes. So there's got to be some kind of I don't know working relationship there or something. Did but... you notice anything Fincher-esque in the directing style? What I noticed was a very strict attention to craft, which I, I appreciated very much. Like we talk about horror films and we often talk about craft because some people try and skip out on it and just throw you a jump scare now and then. They don't build up the suspense. They don't understand how to build up the suspense. They give you a little bit of blood and a little bit of a jump scare and then that's all they do. There's no real craft to it. But I saw a lot of craft here, but that's getting ahead of ourselves. Not much in terms of notable credits that we can talk about for, for David Pryor, which is very surprising to me, but that's who wrote it. Now I'm going to hand it over to you. Break that story. Let's get going. So my one thing for The Empty Man is setup. And this is something you touched on a little bit already, because I think we were both struck by how unique this is. The Empty Man begins with a prologue that is over 20 minutes in length. The opening titles do not even appear on the screen until over 20 minutes have elapsed. And during that particular prologue, we are following four backpackers who go hiking through the mountains. One stumbles into a cave and discovers the skeletal remains of a bizarre creature. And then it infects him, or seemingly infects him. It renders him stricken and catatonic to the point where the other people have to help him out of the cave. And then over the next 20 plus minutes, we see the fates of these four people gradually and slowly unravel. And it is done in such a slow-paced and deliberate manner by the filmmakers because they know they're going to be mining every single idea, shot, and story element that they craft in this first span of 20 minutes. Now think about this. In this day and age, we have so much that vies for our attention. And filmmakers know that. Movies have never had this much to compete with as they do right now. You have social media, you have TikTok videos, you have YouTube videos, you have uh, streaming services, you have video games, you have mobile games, and everyone is deathly afraid that they're going to lose your eyeballs or your attention. So we're throwing out attention-grabbing sequences, even at the sacrifice of narrative flow and development, all so we can rest assured that know that our audience will not be bored. 
not this film. This film is done by competent craftsmen and the director and everybody else involved allows the story to unfurl slowly, gradually, and deliberately. And for me, that is one of the great skills and features of this film. Agreed. Now this was written and directed by David Pryor. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to go with something so audacious as, you know, a 20 minute kind of setup prologue hook, that's basically, your audience is going to think that's the movie. So your cast, how you film, how you build up, has to be that quality. It's like, this is how good the movie's going to be. And this guy absolutely pulls it off. Mm -hmm. Like those actors, even in, they're basically bit players, fantastic. Fantastic. I thought they were the leads. I was convinced this was the film I was getting for the entire way. And then all of a sudden we jump over and I was worried. I'm just like, you're hitting the restart button. Now we've got the ex-cop and we're restarting in a Midwestern town. This is a totally different movie than what I was just watching. Mm -hmm. Are you going to be able to do it? Are you going to be able to pull it off? And he does pull it off. I'm happy that he does pull it off. So I was very impressed with that as well. It's it's a very difficult thing to do, and I think only a writer-director kind of has that confidence to do it. And it's not as though that opening sequence is just a cheap throwaway. Like, sometimes no. in horror movies, you get the cheap throwaway opening scene where like somebody's getting chased around, and they're killed, and then that kind of sets up how you're going to do it. Not here. That first 20 minutes is important because they come back visually to elements that were established then, they come back with story elements and rules that were crafted then, and then even in the third act, which I think is one of the best revelations in the film, they haul everything right back and it kind of comes full circle in terms of how they're gonna incorporate that first opening sequence, which was very suspenseful and very unnerving, which I think is one of the best descriptors of this entire film, is how unnerving it is. Yeah, and that goes to Kraft. The director knows that. He, this is someone who really pays attention to sounds and how sounds can make you uneasy and how certain visuals can make you uneasy and playing off the fear of, of really the unknown is what's so strong here. Now a lot of horror films try and do that. They try and take the unknown um, as, as something that's going to terrify you and slowly peel back layer and layer like a mystery until you actually learn what it is and then you're not afraid anymore. You're like, oh, who cares? Now I know what it is. I know how you're going to kill it. So let's see if they do it or not. This one doesn't do that. It kind of keeps you in that state of suspense and uneasiness all the way through to the end until you're thinking like it's it's almost going to be too late like how is this going to work out like that nervousness and that um anxiety and suspense adds into the fear and the terror it really brings it all together so exceptional job here but let's find out if it is enough to keep this one alive in our dead or alive segment Ooh. It's time. Time for Dead or Alive. It is time. So, what is your verdict? My verdict here for The Empty Man, this is a film that got released back in 2020 from writer-director David Pryor, is Alive. I'm going with Alive for this one, and I'm giving it uh, a decent 7 out of 10. This was uh, a good horror film. Like, this was a well-crafted horror film. It made me feel the suspense, the terror, and the uneasiness that we talked about. And it's a sophisticated, intelligent and it's movie. It is smart. It's, it's something I didn't expect. I couldn't figure out what was going on until they showed me at the end. And it's something I hadn't seen before, I felt like. Mm -hmm. Now, I have puzzled over this movie. I've watched it three, oh, yeah. three times now. And I've puzzled over it, and I've studied it. It's a lie for me. It is an 8 out of 10. Wow. I think... I really think no no one saw this movie, right? People crapped on it. It got a People gutter. Like it. it got a gutter release. I think they cut the trailer maybe a week before it was even released. Like this movie was just shit canned, and they rushed it out there. They don't even care about it. They're just like, if we dumped it in theaters, right? I think we've got a real gem here that will only grow over time in terms of how people come to view it. I'm assuming people do watch it, which I hope they do because I really very much enjoyed it. This. To me, in the repeat viewings, this is a master craftsman who is so deliberate that there's no waste and there's efficiency in everything he used. There's visual motifs for the, the weird skeletal creature and the folded hands that you see repeat over and over again. And there's other visual motifs just like that. Um, there's callbacks. There's a, there's a painting on the wall, the Pontifex Institute, which I didn't see until like the second time I watched it. And it's of the cabin from the opening sequence. It's just up there. Um, and the way the story just kind of unravels and goes deeper and deeper and deeper and then somehow pulls off a satisfying third act twist, like this is, like it's master craftsmanship, 
it, it's close to masterpiece type work and I hope it gets regarded as such because there is some uncommon brilliance in this filmmaking that you just don't see on a regular it's basis. It's very underappreciated. It challenges you as a viewer and I think that's why a lot of people don't like it. Now for me, I, I was worried because as soon as they did the whole thing about think about the empty man on your bridge and you blow over a bottle and then right. three days he's going to come and, and rip you apart. Uh, I didn't like that so much because I thought it was like, oh, we're doing one of these. This is kind of a trope in the horror films. It's like, all right, you got three days. The first day is going to come scare you. The second day is going to be in your bathroom. The third day is going to stick an axe and in And it's probably face. why it took you so long to see this movie. Because the way it's marketed is one of these derivative dumb teen movies where it's just like, there's other ones that have been made where it's like, here's the urban myth or whatever. Yeah. You do this. And it's what I go back to. It's yeah. like, as soon as you reveal too much, I'm no longer scared. Okay? I'm no longer scared. I know what's going to happen. Because you've shown me what's going to happen to the other people. I know the third day it's going to come and it's going to get you. I'm not scared anymore. So I was worried as the film was getting on into the later act that it wouldn't scare me. And then there was that scene where uh, the cop is out at the cabin in the woods looking for files. And then he stumbles called, on... The place is called Camp Elsewhere. Camp which is elsewhere. where his investigation yeah. trying to find this he girl He stumbles leads. on the group yeah. and they're running around a fire out there. And yeah, they're all black and like hooded or something. Yeah. That, yeah, they're robed up, they're hooded, they're they're marching around and a big suddenly flame. they see him and then all hell breaks loose. Oh, he scares the shit out of me there. I didn't think he could scare me after that. And then and then I watched that scene and the way It's the scariest kind of, oh, part. God. Yeah. 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 And I'm just like, well. And before yeah. that, like not even what's that point? He's watching these VHS tapes. Oh, these yeah. These horrifically disturbing and and horrifying VHS tapes about what had gone on there. And then he sees that, oh, you know, somebody's using like their blood and their innards and they're painting something on the wall. And then he sees the painting is on the wall like next to him. He's in the spot where this took place. It's so, again, unnerving. And that directly leads into the sequence you talked about, which we thought was the most frightening Fantastic aspect sequence. of the film. Now, I've only seen it once. You've seen it three times, so I get to ask you a bunch of questions. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully you've thought about this more than me, because I couldn't... <laughs> I hope so. I, I thought about it a I lot. I couldn't figure it out at the... I couldn't really figure out what was going on there and, and what the fear was. I know that we're dealing with, you know, uh, a kind of angry god that's found, like, this empty man to be his vessel to use as an antenna to transmit his thoughts out to people. Right. Right? Yes. So what is really the, the primal basis for the fear here? Is it kind of the fear of the unknown? Is it the fear of indoctrination? What were your thoughts on, on that thematically? Oh, it's, it's the fear of just this oblivion and this chaos, this unmaking. I mean, you have this malevolent entity and you see like in the Pontifex Institute, they're all teaching everybody like, Nothing can be known, or nothing can be understood, and nothing can be communicated. It's kind of un unmaking, and it's that, that we don't know anything. Maybe that's the whole correct. point of it. Is, is that, that there is no just reality? Don't know. You're just a, in an abyss, and that you're 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 less than. You're like you're you're something that can be directed by this malevolent, darker entity, and you're unmade. Fear. And you lose your own agency. Fear of the unknown. Fear correct. of yeah. staring out into that vast abyss, which they do many times, and finding out that there's something out there you don't know about that's staring right back at you and that's where you fear and something that you thought was wrong might not be wrong so everything that you question everything about existence about what you know what you think you know your values all that stuff okay here's the other big question let's right. see if you can answer this satisfying for me um when when they say they created mm -hmm. yeah when did they create him they create him, and I think the girl explicitly states when his birthday was. And he goes to, I think it was a Mexican restaurant. And yeah. It's like his first scene. Yeah. And the little girl stares at him, and he kind of raises a finger like this. And, yeah. And that's it. And they say, that was your birthday, and that's why you had your birthday coupon. So literally, he's he's there for the span of three but days. But he's a regular person before that, isn't he? No. So even so, his relate here's the thing. Even his relationship with those other police officers who know him as a prior cop, that's all imagined. Mm -hmm. Okay. He is uh he is a manifestation. And you see all the videos in the Pontifex Institute where there's like manifestation fourteen. And she indicates we had tried this before. We needed to program somebody with guilt, with regret, with right. you know, I, these, I these negative emotions. And that's why we gave you the backstory that we gave you. And that's from our th concentrated thought did you spring forth because that's the whole thing about this cult is that they are receivers and that their thought can manifest whatever it is and they're getting the signal from 
not the empty man, but whatever the force is behind it. The empty man is the conduit, the tulpa, that uh, that they use to transmit the signal. Okay, and then why kill all the kids on the bridge? There's a I scene with all of our friends. They blow in the bottle. Most of them end up dead on the bridge. Well, that's my... They're hunted down. It's like he, uh, the last one well, was killed in a And fight. I still have this particular question, right? right? Because the detective, his name is James Lasombra, who's our protagonist, that's right? right? And he is basically conjured into being to be a vessel, to be the next empty man, to replace um, the gentleman who's he's become too weak to continue to harness this power. So my thought was, well, then... If that's what you need is this particular vessel, why then does the empty man and the third day kill the people who he comes to? That's right. Are Which they is what he sacrifices. Does. Maybe? I don't know. I mean, it's. It, I think it certainly depicts to you that this is a malevolent entity, that yeah. this is an entity bent on destruction and unmaking things, which I think is necessary because if he didn't kill them, then what are we going to really fear? But this is something that does seek to unmake you for its own pleasure, for its own delight. And, you know, that's the ritual. You blow into the bottle you, while you're on the bridge, and the empty man comes for you. He comes for you. Yes. Great stuff there. Uh, I thought it was absolutely criminal when I checked out David Pryor and found out he didn't have really any other big features that he had directed or Hopefully, written. this is the beginning that of has a to long change. and marvelous career, because we're all going to be better off the more films that David Pryor gets to write and direct. All right. So there you go. As your marching orders, go and watch The Empty Man. You can find it streaming on HBO Max, Amazon Prime if you're a member. It's worth your time. If you like horror, go ahead and check out The Empty Man. But that wraps us up here for this one. It does. Guys, if you have seen this movie, if you have your own thoughts about it, if you didn't like it, if you really liked it, please let us know in the comments down below. If you liked this um, segment, please give us a thumbs up. If you really loved it, go ahead and give us a subscription because we're going to see you all as we're back on the next one.